Story 1. I think an abandoned school is a wendigo nest. Soon I will fall asleep and wake up from this terrible dream. An endless night will come and I will rise. In my mind, I hope that after all those terrible events, that's exactly what would happen. I was always the man in the group who believed in the cryptids and the rest, I always looked for the paranormal answer first. This was partly because my uncle was also very interested in all things dark, creepy, and mysterious. Aliens, spirits, monsters, theories, and such things have always been his subject. I knew he was the man to talk to if something strange happened to me, because no one else would believe me. Because of my uncle's influence, I learned not to marry anything that can kill me. Ghosts, monsters, demons, etc. This skill has helped me throughout my life. All up to this series of events. December 2015. Me and some friends decided to visit our old school, which is now abandoned. Yes, what a terrible arrangement. Abandoned school, few friends, night, winter. A classic horror movie scenario. Wouldn't any normal person enjoy this? Well, I wouldn't call us normal. You could say we're weird. Now this was our high school and it was quite far from my home. About 20 to 30 minutes by car. The scenery was terrible. It was in the forest and the snow made driving difficult. The whole trip took about 40 minutes. When we arrived, the gate was clearly closed. No one has been in this place for years. I don't even know why they went out of business. It was also a private school and seemed to be doing quite well. Before jumping the gate, we just looked around and didn't see any cars, houses, or people around us for five to six miles. Chris brought up and said we should have brought a flashlight. I consoled him and pulled four flashlights from my backpack. I came prepared. I gave one to Chris and the rest of the team, so I keep one for myself. Now that everyone was fully prepared, we jumped over the fence and headed to the parking lot. It was huge. We walked about a minute to the entrance of the school. It just goes to show how big the parking lot was. The school is even bigger. We got to the entrance and we'll try to push open the door. Of course it was locked. Right chained. We didn't realize it was chained at first. In fact, there was nothing left but to break the door glass. I told Will and Andrew to go find a big rock to break the glass while me and Chris go look around the main entrance for other doors. We nodded and parted, agreeing to meet at the main entrance whenever we were done with our work. As Chris and I walked around the school, we came to the window area near the back entrance. The window area is basically a huge wall of windows in all the classrooms. Four floors of classrooms. Chris tapped me on the shoulder and told me to look out the left window. Second floor. See? He said. What? I feel like a pair of eyes, he whispered. Devil. I screamed quietly. Chris put his mouth on mine as we both looked at what the hell was on the horribly broken window. 
We slowly moved away from it on our way to our destination, which happened to be right next to the window. The snow made our steps difficult, and as we approached the window, eyes turned towards us. Chris and I jumped down. As the snow slowly covered our white coats, we were seemingly invisible. The creature must have missed us because it looked back towards the large football field and then disappeared. We got up and continued to the back in trance, all the while debating what the hell had just happened. What the hell was that? Shouted out loud asked as if asking me. I don't know. I heard too many stories about different creatures, and what we saw I can't say. I was. Literally. Everything. I tried to explain to him. Jesus Christ, man. This shit makes me even more stressed and worried than before. Damn abandoned school, said Chris with fear in his voice. Backslash in. When we approached the back entrance, which was a cafeteria built into the school, we heard a loud sound that resembled broken glass. We were scared as hell. I looked at Chris and he looked at me. We understood each other perfectly without words. We immediately ran back to the front door to see what the hell the noise was about. As we approached, my phone rang. I looked at the number, and it was Will. Hey man, we managed to find a big rock and broke the glass door. Oh, thank God. We were startled when we heard that damn noise from the front door. We're going. Yeah, one more thing. There's another door behind the first one. So? Yeah, I know. You can break it with the same stone? Yes, see you here. We almost had a heart attack. Will and Andrew broke another glass door. We got together and entered the front door. We decided to part as before. However, this time, because we didn't bring a walkie-talkie, we were always on the phone. We all agreed and Chris and I went to the cafeteria and cafeteria area while Will and Andrew went to the classrooms. Especially 7th and 8th grade classrooms. Let's clarify the school graphical layout for you to grasp the entire story. Thank you. The school has four floors as mentioned before. On the first floor, there are rooms one to three. Grade and kindergarten children fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Classes 7 and 8 are on the third floor with a cafeteria and cafeteria. And finally, on the fourth floor, where there is an IT room, there are high school students from the first to fourth grades. Now there is also a basement with a swimming pool and the smallest kindergartens that could go to school. Yes, it is versatile and large. Now, as we said before, Chris and I want to see the cafe and the cafe slash kitchen. Seventh and eighth grade are on opposite sides of a huge hallway. The walk up to the third floor was absolutely terrifying. As we climbed the first staircase to the third floor, we were petrified by the loud noise of something falling in the nursery, the one on the first floor. And damn, we were scared. What the hell was that? exclaimed Chris, swearing a surprising amount. I don't know, man. I screamed in the middle with a trembling voice, as I usually do when I'm scared. 
Oh my god, that was such a terrible idea. It's something. Guaranteed. Hey, don't worry. Let's stop this quest, or whatever it's doing here. Wait, what are we doing here? Asked Chris. That shook me for some reason. What are we doing here? I really couldn't remember. Yeah, I really don't know. I know it sounds stupid, but when Andrew suggested that we go here, I just listened and didn't ask why. I was so excited. The only thought of doing something like that. I've always wanted to explore a huge abandoned building like this. I explained, asking myself the same question. Why are we here? This time we just didn't leave everything. Go. It was really scary, especially when Andrew didn't even improve here. Chris and I were surprised. We had already walked to the third floor while discussing this and decided to go to the cafe. Chris pulled out a flashlight and tried to light it. It didn't work. Oh shit. I thought to myself, I forgot to put batteries in some lanterns. Shit. Let's just hope mine is fully charged or at least somewhat charged. Fortunately, it was. When I turned on the flashlight, I realized we hadn't heard from Andrew or Will in a while. I kept looking at my phone and... What the hell? I especially remember telling everyone to charge their phones. I also borrow mine at 100%. Heck, I even remember seeing that percentage around 95% on the first call. This is very strange. When Chris realized my phone was dead, he started throwing out random theories about ghosts turning off our technology and stuff like that. I just told him it could be some kind of battery or software problem and tried restarting the phone. It started and the Apple logo appeared on the screen. Finally, we arrived at the cafe. Now this place is huge, and I mean huge. It must have about 100 seats. I didn't count the tables, but I remember that I could feed a huge number of people at the same time. We looked at some tables to see if we could find anything interesting. Nothing. We decided to go to the kitchen, which was located in the cafe itself at the back. We had just turned to the kitchen door when we heard a loud noise from the kitchen. Shit! shouted Chris and ran out of the door of the cafe. I myself was petrified. I couldn't move my legs or arms. I was so afraid of this sudden noise. Like a jump scare, but two hundred times worse. When I finally got the strength to move my legs, I immediately ran for the exit. I managed to see something that looked like a kitchen, behind the counter. Something human, but not human. Hard to explain. Strange dark, yet light skin. That's what I got from this brief look. As I ran out the cafeteria door, I saw Chris running towards the 7th and 8th grade classroom, where Will and Andrew were. He called their names and told them we have to get out of this place. I ran towards him, and when I turned the corner to enter the 7th classroom, I managed to see something terrible. Through the door of the cafe, Something very similar to the disorder scene in the cafe began to look. Not alone this time. With two friends, similarly. Holy shit. 
I thought to myself, I finally made it to the seventh grade classroom to find it littered and empty. I came out of it to see Will and Chris in the bathroom with scared looks on their faces, motioning me into the bathroom. You don't believe the hell, I tried to say. Yeah, we saw that too. Some damn weird thing, Will whispered. Hey. Next to the cafe is three more, I whispered. Wait, where's Andrew? Realization hit me. He just... I attempted to answer, but Will's right hand remained next to my mouth while I looked silent. When we saw two of these, creatures come out of the seventh grade classroom and look around at us. I assumed. Chris, meanwhile, was quietly crying in one of the bathrooms. You could barely hear him. Until he did something that made me want to kill him immediately. A short, loud snort came from the department store where Chris was. I saw one of them turn to us in the reflection and start walking. Story 2 how I survived and killed a Wendigo. My family was shocked when we heard our Uncle Benjamin was found dead in the woods surrounding his vacation home. I didn't know him very well, as he lived far away from most of the family. So, I only saw him at family meetings. His funeral wasn't a big event. There were my two aunts. Lucy and Lara, my other uncle Stephen, and my little nephew, Mikey. In Ben's will was written that I got his vacation home. I figured that it was nice to spend some time in a place where there was no distraction, as I had to study for my exams. Also, if I were to rent a small apartment, I would probably have to live off instant noodles and water for a few months. The day after the funeral, I packed up my things so that I could move to my new home. The drive itself was uneventful, though I did underestimate the length of the drive. When I was driving through the woods, I thought that I saw a face or two amongst the trees but I just blamed it on my mind for being a bit sleepy as it was around 11 p.m. when I arrived. Once I was there, I put all the food I had in the fridge and made my bed so I could sleep. When I woke up the next day, I showered, made some breakfast, and hopped in front of the TV to watch a show on Netflix. Halfway through my show, I thought I heard barking coming from the woods, but didn't think anything of it as I thought it was coming from my show. However, the barking did not stop, so I decided to check it out. I walked a bit in the direction I thought it was coming from, but I couldn't find anything. So, I shrugged and walked back. The rest of the day was uneventful. I did, however, sort out a few moving boxes. As it was getting kind of late, I decided to watch one more episode of my show and head to bed afterwards. The next day started off normal. I showered, ate breakfast, and started to unpack a few boxes However, around 10 a.m. I heard it again. Barking? This time I knew it wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me, as I heard it loud and clear. I directly stopped unpacking and went to investigate the noise. When I went into the woods to check out the sound, I found a tiny Labrador pup. It was covered in mud and scratches. I knew I couldn't just leave him there, so I took him home. I gave him a bath to get all the mud and filth off him 
and then I took him to the closest vet, which was about five miles away. Once we arrived, I took a seat in the waiting room. I couldn't help but notice that the other people in the room had a small look of judgment towards me. I totally understood why, as the pup looked like he had been attacked. When it was our turn, I heard a soft whimper coming from the pup, but he did decide to walk with me to the room. After a few checkups, the vet asked me if I owned the pup. I said no and that I found him in the woods. The vet went quiet for a second and asked me if I wanted him to check for a chip. I said yes and the vet checked, but found no chip. So, I suggested that if he didn't belong to anyone, I could take care of him. The vet sighed and wouldn't get the papers for me to fill in so I could take the pup home. On the way home, I went to the local pet store to buy some toys, food and a food and water bowl. After buying all the stuff I would need to take care of him, I thought of a name for him. After about five minutes of thinking, I came up with the perfect name. Winston. I called out. Winston directly jumped up from his seat and started barking and wagging his tail. When we got home, I directly put everything in place. I put his dog bed next to the couch with some toys and his food and water bowl in front of the TV. After that long day, I was very tired, so I decided to watch a few episodes of my show. When I sat down, Winston started whining whilst wagging his tail. I asked, Do you want to sit next to me? He answered the question with a happy growl and jumped on the couch beside me. I watched TV until it was around 10 p.m. and decided to go to bed. I decided to put Winston's bed in the bedroom next to me for the first night so that he could get used to the house. When I woke up the next morning, I noticed that Winston's bed was empty and that the bedroom door was open. I thought that he had walked through the door to watch the birds through the giant window in the living room. However, when I went to check, I didn't see him. But then I noticed that the front door was wide open, even though I knew I locked it the previous night. My heart dropped. I panicked and ran out of the door to find him. After about 20 minutes of searching, I finally found him with a leaf he found in his mouth. I picked him up and carried him inside. It was near lunchtime, so I decided to put a frozen pizza in the microwave. I was very hungry as I hadn't eaten anything for breakfast. After eating, I took Winston for a walk but he kept on looking into the tree line, as if something were there. Each time I thought he saw something, I looked, but couldn't see anything. After about ten minutes of walking, I decided to head back to the house. I am glad I made that decision, because right after I closed the door behind us it started storming. The sky became a brown slash yellow color, and I could see the clouds rolling over. I'd seen this weather only once before. I was visiting a friend that moved to the Netherlands, then I first saw this type of weather. I decided to make some hot chocolate for myself and sat down on the couch to binge watch my show for a while. Winston was sleeping right next to me. After a while, I fell asleep too, but I was awakened by Winston, whining by the front door. I decided to check up on him 
and noticed that he was shivering from fear. I looked through the window of the front door and saw nothing. I figured it was some deer walking by that had spooked the little pup. I picked Winston up and carried him to the couch so that I could cuddle him to ease his nerves. The next morning, I woke up early and decided to do an early morning walk with Winston. After walking a bit, I saw a pack of deer just roaming around in an open area in the forest. This only reinforced my thought of Winston being scared from some deer just roaming around on our property. However, when we came back from our walk, I noticed something different about the front door. Scratch marks. Upon closer inspection, I saw that the scratches were massive. They were all about 10 inches long and 1 inch deep. Now I'm no expert in forest animals, but I dang well know that those didn't belong to a deer. I decided to call a door repairman to fix it. They arrived in about 30 minutes. Those are some massive marks on your door. Bud, one of the men said, Yeah, I would get something for protection if I were you, the other one said. I followed his advice and later bought a small pistol to protect myself and Winston. After I got back from the gun store, the men were already done with the door. I gave them a thank you and they left. The following day started off normal. I woke up, had an early shower, and decided to do another early walk with Winston. I saw two squirrels fighting over some pine cones, a flock of birds flying in the opposite direction of my house, and I think I spotted a small mouse running through the freshly fallen leaves. However, Winston was shivering against my leg, whining. I asked what was wrong and he basically jumped. I decided then and there to head back. I heard something growl in the distance and another flock of birds flew in the opposite direction of the sound. When I was back on my property, I noticed something weird. My front door was ripped from its hinges and was lying about three meters to the left. I directly pulled my pistol out of my pocket because I didn't know if who or whatever had left yet. When I walked into the house, I froze. There were scratches everywhere. Whatever had done this had enormous claws. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that the claw marks were the exact same as the ones on the door from yesterday. I also noticed that my fridge door was hanging from its hinges. When I looked in the fridge, I saw that it was a mess. All the meat was gone, and all the drawers were ripped out of the fridge. I put the front door back in its place using the tools I had recently unpacked and fixed up the fridge. After I was done, I decided to take a little break, so I sat on the couch with my drink. After a while, I moved my arm only to touch something wet and squishy. I jumped and looked at what I had touched. It was the body of a squirrel. Well, at least what was left of it. The squirrel was mangled in gruesome ways. A part of its skull was missing. Its intestines were hanging out of its stomach and its hind legs were broken. However, it didn't bleed anymore. I guess all the blood was soaked into the couch. I cleaned up the blood and buried the squirrel. 
I put a small stick on the grave as a sign of respect. After that I decided it was time to pack my things. When I was about halfway done with putting everything in boxes it was already late in the evening. I figured it wouldn't hurt to stay here one more night, but I was very wrong about that. I was woken up by Winston. He had jumped on the bed to hide with me. He was shivering and whining because he sensed that something was wrong. I stood up. Winston let out a bark to warn me. God, I should have listened. I went to the front door as Winston was looking right at it. I looked through the window and saw something big. It looked like a deer, but I knew it wasn't one. It had massive antlers and a skull-like face, and the smell. Oh God, the smell. It smelled like a corpse that had been rotting out in the sun for days. When I heard another bark coming from Winston, the thing looked up and tried to smash the door with its head. I directly pulled out my pistol and fired two shots. The thing howled in pain and ran away. After that thing ran away, I began to grab my stuff. I grabbed the most important things that I would need, picked up Winston and ran to my car. When I opened the car door, I heard the thing let out a cry behind me. I didn't look back. I hopped in my car and drove off. I'm glad that there wasn't much traffic on the road, as I was going about 90 miles an hour. I mean, can you really blame me for it? I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. While driving to get out of the woods, I saw the trees flash by. It reminded me of the first night I got here. However, it looked much different in the daytime. It also reminded me of the face I had seen amongst the trees. I now know it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me that night, as the face I had seen looked exactly like the face of that thing. Lost in thought, I wasn't paying much attention on the road. However, I was directly awakened by the sudden movement in the trees. When I looked towards the movement, I jumped in my seat. That thing suddenly jumped in front of my car. I screamed. The creature looked at me and lunged towards me. I slammed the gas pedal and drove around the creature. It stared right at me with its hollow eyes as I drove past. For hours later, I was back in my hometown. I figured I would go to my aunt and Uncle Lucy and Stephen, but then I remembered that Mikey was allergic to dogs. So, I went to my other Aunt Laura. I figured that she would like the company of me and Winston because of the sudden passing of her brother. I texted her. I was coming over and that I was taking my new friend with me. She told me that it was nice for me to come over, but then she asked me why I would drive all that way just to see her. I told her that I would explain when I got there. After about 20 minutes of driving, I arrived at her place. She opened the door and looked at my face. What's wrong, sweetie? She asked me. I guess I was still looking a bit frightened after today's events. I asked if we could go inside. She agreed and we sat on the couch. Is that your new friend? She asked, looking at Winston. I told her yes and that his name was Winston. That's a cute name, she said. Then she asked, why I was here and why I looked so pale. I told her everything. I told her about Winston, 
about that monster and about all the weird stuff that happened. She went silent for a bit. Then she asked me if I could describe the appearance of the thing. I told her about the antlers, the skull-like face, and the smell. After I told her about it, she looked terrified. She told me that my uncle called her multiple times about a giant creature roaming around on his property, and the next day he was found dead near his vacation home. She then told me that there were massive claw marks on his corpse and that he was hanging from his intestines, which were pulled out of his stomach. I was shocked. I asked if she had a laptop or computer I could use. She said yes and that she would go and get it for me. She came back with her old laptop and gave it to me. I opened Google and searched for the creature. After about 10 minutes of searching, I found out what kind of creature it was. It was called a Wendigo. After reading a bit, I knew that the creature that had attacked me was a Wendigo. I told Laura, and she was as pale as a ghost. We talked some more about all the events of the past week. But after about 20 minutes, Winston started whining. My aunt just chalked it up to Winston still being young. But I knew that wasn't the case. I told Laura that we needed to go. And she asked why. I told her that there was no time. But she insisted that she was going to stay. Then she looked at the window. Looking back through the kitchen window was the Wendigo. She screamed. I tried to run after her, but she was too fast. She ran out of the front door, only to face the Wendigo. What happened next will haunt me for the rest of my life. The Wendigo opened its mouth and roared. Then it unhinged its jaw and bit her head clean off. Winston almost ran out of the door, but I picked him up just in time. The creature looked at me and grinned. I could still see pieces of my aunt on its teeth. I ran for the back door and out on the street. I didn't stop running until I could taste blood in my mouth. After checking if everything was safe, I collapsed underneath an oak tree. I was woken up in the morning by Winston. After remembering what had happened the previous day, I started crying. Winston curled up beside me to ease my nerves. I'm glad you're here with me, buddy, I said. After fully waking up, I figured that the best thing to do was to go back to my car and drive far away from here. However, when I was back at Aunt Lara's house, I saw that my car was turned into a wreck, the windows were smashed, the metal had been turned into shreds, and one of my car doors was hanging loose. I checked the back seat and saw that my bag was intact. I had left all my money in the bag, so it was nice that I still had it with me. After grabbing my bag, I headed towards the shopping mall to buy some food, as I had left all my food in the vacation house. While walking, I realized that the Wendigo had most likely followed me. I decided to head to the library to learn more about the beast mostly on how to get rid of it. When I entered, the nice librarian greeted me. I asked if there were any books about Wendigo. She told me that she would check, and I gave her a thank you. After a while, she told me that there were two books in the horror section and one in the mythology section. I thanked her and headed to the horror section to find them. After searching for about eight minutes, 
I found them. Once I was done, I headed to the mythology section to find the last book. Then I headed to the exit. The librarian asked me if I had a pass, and I told her no, but that I had money. She scanned the books and I left. I decided to head to the grocery store afterwards, as I noticed it was lunchtime already. I bought a sandwich for myself and some treats for Winston. After eating, I decided to head to the local park to walk Winston. I walked about 10 minutes until I found a bench and decided to sit down and read the books I bought. When I opened the first book, I directly looked up how I could kill the beast. When I couldn't find anything, I opened the second book. After looking, I didn't find anything either. I opened the last book that I had gotten from the mythology section. When I searched, I found information on how to kill the Wendigo. I directly went to the page and read that I needed silver bullets or a silver weapon. I remembered that there was a gun store about one mile away, so I decided to pack my things and head in that direction. When I entered the store, I asked if they had silver bullets. They told me they had and that they would go and look for me. Sometime later they came back and put a small box on the counter in front of me. I knew that it was going to be pricey, but I had enough money to buy ten bullets. I also bought a new gun, as I figured that my pistol was too small to even fit the bullets. After I made my purchase, I walked out of the door and was greeted by Winston, who was wagging his tail happily. I told him that we were finally safe and that I was going to protect him no matter the cost. He let out a bark of joy and we walked off. After my little trip to the gun store, it was almost evening. I knew I had enough time to get ready for the fight with the Wendigo. I put three of my bullets in the gun and waited. After about six minutes of waiting, Winston started whining. I knew then and there that the beast was close. I stood up and turned off the safety of my gun. I heard the thing roar in the distance. I looked in the direction of the sound, and there it was, the Wendigo. I immediately fired two shots and the beast howled out in pain, and it started charging towards me. I fired another shot, which gave me enough time to reload. I put another three bullets in the gun and fired all of them a second later. One of the bullets had hit its leg and another its eye. It collapsed and it cried out in pain. Winston started throwing a barking fit, which agitated the beast more. But it couldn't do anything as one of its legs was broken. I loaded another three bullets in the gun and fired the final three shots right into its heart. It fell unconscious, but I knew it wasn't dead as I had read that I needed to cut the heart out. I grabbed my survival knife and walked towards the hell spawn. I stabbed the rest of its legs and slit its throat. Then I began carving in its chest to get to the heart. After about 20 minutes of cutting, I had finally cut out the heart. I put the heart in my bag and headed back to Winston. Winston was hiding on the other side of the rock, where I had waited for the beast. Once he heard my voice call out, he started sprinting towards me. I kneeled and he started giving me kisses. I cleaned my hands in the nearby lake 
and we headed towards the nearest motel to sleep. When I woke up the next day, I showered, had breakfast, and headed to the nearest church so I could bury the heart. When I showed it to the nuns there, they escorted me to a burial place. I grabbed a shovel and started digging. After about five minutes of digging, I had created a big enough hole to bury the heart in. I put the heart in the hole and closed it. Then I went to the nearby field to pick two flowers. An ox eye daisy for my uncle and a buttercup for my aunt, as it was her favorite flower. I walked back to the grave and placed down the flowers. I then went to my Aunt Lucy and my Uncle Stephen. I told them about everything. When I was done talking, they were speechless. I couldn't blame them, as I knew that the story would shock them. After they processed the story, they asked me if I was okay. I told them that I was still a bit shocked by everything that had happened. After we were done talking, they showed me the room I could stay in and then asked me if I could keep Winston away from Mikey, as he was allergic. I told them that it would be no problem as Winston was very well behaved. After we had lunch together, I asked if they had a laptop I could use. Uncle Stephen went to get it for me as me and my aunt chatted for a bit. A minute later, Stephen came back with a laptop and handed it over to me. I then excused myself from the table and went to my room, where I began typing this story to get this message out to everyone. All I have to say is this. Listen to your instincts. It saved my life and I believe it could also save many others as well. If you notice some strange things in the woods, get out of there as quick as you can. It's hunting you. Story 3 The Time I Saw a Wendigo First things first, this happened to me when I was around 10. I've lived in Idaho all my life, and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother, and I would always hike up whatever trials we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River, the river there never freezes over, and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel board through the mountain at one part of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when the eye heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-thirds of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end we entered through. The screech wasn't like anything I've heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights. I even think I've heard Bigfoot calls a few times, but never the metallic, grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, Whatever the sound was, it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it, and my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made the noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. 
Whether it was the thing that screeched at us or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing through the darkness outside the trailer. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was, but he refused each time, telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day, and my life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but chalked what happened up as a harmless event that I must have been exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here I would mess around with my cousins, our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide and seek, a game called Ghosts in the Graveyard, and other games like that. In one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide and seek game. Because I was one of the younger cousins, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally, all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the nearby trees or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit. We would always whistle as a hint at our locations. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree known as the underwear tree. You can guess why. So I began trekking up toward the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on wearily and convinced myself that I would be fine. I hated walking in the night alone, but figured whoever I find would walk me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong, because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out, I found you, Scott. I thought the whistle was my older cousin's. Come back down with me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call, You almost had me. So I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features. As soon as I saw the creature I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp I saw a few people, my cousins, at the bottom of the mountain waiting for me. I was crying and shaking and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night, and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games after that happened, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. 
I used to be really religious and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that. But those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago the game, Until Dawn, became really popular and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in the game, I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figure someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge and resorted to cannibalism, but that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screech from time to time. It never occurred to me until watching until dawn that they might be from the same thing, and it scares the hell out of me every time. I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. Story 4 This is how you kill a Wendigo. My twin sister Janessa was murdered at age 16. I witnessed it like a coward from atop a tree in the forest where it happened. I'd actually blacked out the memory for a while. I knew she was dead, but I couldn't remember how it happened. It wasn't until I tried therapy that it slowly came back to me. I was also reminded of how much my parents used to fight. Our family was planning on a camping trip the day before my sister's death. Before leaving, my parents erupted into another massive fight. Janessa and I had been looking forward to the trip, and once again our parents' awful communication skills were ruining it before it even began. We snuck out of the house and took a lift to the forest. We left our phones at home, not caring whether our parents would be worried sick. We enjoyed ourselves the first day. I set up our tent, made a fire, had esmores, and did all that stuff typically associated with camping. The next morning everything changed. I woke up alone in our tent. Outside I hear my sister talking to someone. Inquisitive, I opened the tent and saw someone sitting at our now-out campfire who looked just like me. The figure transformed as soon as Janessa realized it wasn't me. Together we ran off, that thing rushing after us with heavy steps. I was faster than my sister and a bit more athletic. I grabbed onto a tree branch and climbed up a tree. Janessa was not so lucky. I watched it happen. I watched that thing tear my sister to pieces. I'm still haunted by her screams. I also understand now why she always appears badly mutilated in my nightmares. I stayed up in that tree overnight, my sister's corpse lying in the leaves. Her remaining eye is always staring up at me. While in therapy, there was a moment when I suddenly recalled the hallucination I had the morning after my sister's death. I thought I saw her corpse clawing at the tree where I hid. She wanted me to come down and join her. It caused me to panic and cry out. A couple of men who had been camping in the area heard my screams, and at last I was rescued. My parents don't argue anymore. I hardly see them at all anymore since my sister's death. We're an upper-middle-class family. Over the last couple of years, my parents have frequently gone on vacations. They don't tell me where, and I never ask. I usually just wake up and find out they've left yet again. I'm out of high school now, and I have no career path yet. 
I've only really had one thing on my mind since I remembered what killed Janessa. Now I'm returning to the forest where she died. Now I'm going to go after the thing that killed her. I've been preparing for this, and if it is a Wendigo like I've suspected, then I'm more than ready to take my revenge. This is how I'm doing it. I took a ride in a lift again. Had the driver known what I was carrying in my bags, I doubt they would have let me in. As I sat there, the realization of what I was doing grew heavily on me. What the hell am I doing? I've been talking myself up for the last couple of years. As much as I want a glorious victory, the closer I've come to this day, the more I daydream about dying the same way Janessa did. As angry as I am with my parents, I don't think they deserve to lose their only remaining child. But I just can't move on knowing that thing is still out there. My legs were as dense as gold once I tried to exit the cab. The driver watched awkwardly as I struggled to pull myself out while putting on my backpack and working to carry the other supplies. Why was I doing this alone? I don't want anyone else getting hurt in this, I think. But God, I wish I wasn't out here doing this alone. With each step I took into the forest, the more the terror numbed. I was in the domain of Wendigo now. I wasn't entirely sure how much of the information about them was real. I knew they could change their appearance. I know that their true form is just like the drawings people have made. There's no way to be an expert on these things unless you've actually dealt with one. I'm still not sure why it decided not to come after me. Based on its size, I doubt it would have had any difficulty. Instead, I'm still alive and crazy enough to come back and pick a fight. As I set up camp, I found myself jumping at the sound of any bird call or movement from a nearby animal. The way I hammered in my tent, I knew I was calling attention to myself. In my left pants pocket was a gun. Like werewolves, I'd heard that silver bullets were necessary to kill Wendigos. What if I'm wrong? The thought had been with me ever since I'd stepped foot back into these woods. I stopped frequently while setting up. Behind a nearby tree, I was almost certain I could see someone watching me and then hiding behind it again. I didn't bother to walk over and check it out. I finished up my tent and made my sleeping bag inside. As I did this, I heard calls that sounded almost human off in the distance. It probably knew I was here. The minutes went by slowly, but soon dusk set upon the forest. I built a fire like the one Janessa and I had made. I roasted two marshmallows. Despite her absence, I made an esmore for her as well, resting it on a sizable rock near the fire. As I ate it, I thought about our last night together. All things considered, it was pleasant. Being twins, we had moments where we'd gotten into arguments like our parents. We'd fought one another. We had our problems. But that night had been pleasant. I'd actually been glad we decided to camp without our parents. As frightened as I still was, I felt a warmth not from the fire. A sense of calm overcame me as my memories were suddenly flooded with the good times Janessa and I had. The good times were not for long. 
I could hear footsteps not far behind me. Jeremy. I could never forget that voice. It sounded just like Janessa, but I knew it wasn't her. For some reason, I felt compelled to sit there calmly. As it approached, I could tell it was going over to take a seat at the rock where I'd left the yes more. I glanced delicately to my right. I watched as a figure that looked almost identical to the Janessa, I remembered picked up the yes more and took a bite. That's not yours. I surprised myself by blurting that out. The fake Janessa ignored me, continuing to scarf it down. My terror turned to anger. The thing responsible for my sister's death was standing right next to me, mocking my grief. I didn't wait for it to finish. I pulled out my gun and pointed it directly at the figure. Before I could fire, the creature jumped to the left and turned around. I was struck with paralysis when I saw the mutilated face of my sister's corpse staring back at me. I'm trapped, Jeremy. I struggled to keep aim. How dare that thing pretend to be her? It won't let me go. And it won't let you go either. We can be together again. It's so much nicer than going home to an empty house and unloving parents. She held her hand out to me. Trust me, brother. Please. My trigger finger felt as though struck with a serious case of arthritis. Janessa took a step towards me. Wait. No. It's not Janessa. Why did I suddenly forget that? Feed the forest with me, Jeremy. It's so much better being dead. P.P.R. Prove it. At last I pulled the trigger. The creature hollered in pain as it fell to the ground. I'd hit a lung, which wouldn't be enough. I aimed the gun at its heart, but failed to pull the trigger as it rolled over and jumped back to its feet. Within seconds it transformed from a corpse of my sister to its massive dark skeletal form with massive antlers. My mind was caught between fight and flight. I stood there aiming my gun, but desperately wanted to flee. As it rushed towards me, I chose the later option. I rushed over to the bag I'd left near the tent. Inside was a weapon I'd built myself. As I rushed over, I could tell I wasn't going to be able to outrun it. I fired another shot. The bullet lodged itself inside the neck of the beast. It cried out once more, buying me a bit of time to get to the back. Why did I have it zipped up? As I tried to open it, the Wendigo rushed towards me again. Just like on the day of Janessa's death, I ran from the campsite further into the forest. History was repeating itself. I was going to fail to avenge my sister. My parents were going to lose their last remaining child. All because I couldn't let this go. After at least several minutes, I'd somehow managed to keep outrunning it. I refused to slow down and look behind my shoulder. As I kept running, I noticed that I'd gone in some sort of circle. Up ahead of me was the campsite. I had a chance to grab the bag and pull out the weapon. The closer I came to the campsite, the louder the Wendigo's footsteps became. I could almost feel the wind as the creature tried to claw at me. Once I reached the campsite, I put my hand out clutching the back. 
It felt like almost too great a risk to put my gun back in my pocket, but I needed free to pull out the weapon. I managed to do just that and used my left hand to pull out a long metal spike. I'd built it in such a way as to have the spike shoot out at the push of a button. The Wendigo wasn't going to slow down until it had me. I had no choice. I had to turn around. I had to have perfect timing. I had to collect my debt from the creature that took my twin sister. Chew on this, you son of a bitch. I turned around, pressing the button that shot the spike out. Less than a foot from my face was the Wendigo. Its cry so loud my ears hurt and began to ring. I'd done it. The spike had pierced the heart. Silver. Weakly the Wendigo tried to swipe at me, but somehow lacked the strength. The next part was a gamble. I pulled out my gun and shot it in the head. It wasn't going to be enough to end the Wendigo assuming what I'd read up was correct. I rushed back over to where I dropped my back. Inside was a silver axe I'd also designed myself. When I returned the creature was still conscious letting out continuous agonizing cries. I felt no sympathy. I hacked away at its wrists first. Its claws were the biggest threat, and I wanted them gone. Despite the weight lifting I'd been doing, it took over a dozen hacks to remove the first long fingered hand. I pulled out my gun and shot it again in the head. It subdued the creature long enough for me to remove the second hand and then I began on its head. As it began waking up again, I found myself screaming at the creature. I demanded it stay dead, calling it every insulting name that came to mind. Once I'd hacked most of the way through its head, I pulled it off. I kicked it a couple of feet away. The Wendigo no longer moved. It took over an hour, but I'd managed to put each limb, the head and torso in the trash bags I'd brought along. One by one, I carried them back to the campsite. I lit another fire, burning each bag. It took until dawn for me to burn the body. I left the torso for last. It was a struggle but I managed to remove the heart, rip it to pieces, and placed it in a silver box. After locking it, I looked around the site and decided to leave everything except my gun and the box behind. I was never particularly religious, but in the months leading up to my fight, I'd gotten to know a priest at a church in my area called Street Alphonsus. Luckily for me, he was there when I arrived with the silver box. His face went several shades paler when I showed it to him. Nevertheless, he escorted me to the back of the church with a pair of shovels and helped me bury it. Once done, I sat there suddenly flooded with overwhelming emotions. I did it. The Wendigo had been slain. I'd done it. My sister's killer was dead. Its body was burned, her heart in pieces and buried. Janessa! I cried out. I kept my promise. I killed it. The Wendigo can't get anyone else. It won't kill anyone else. I placed my lowered head in my hands and continued to cry. I'm sorry I wasn't braver before, I whimpered. I'm so sorry I wasn't stronger before. 
I placed some flowers on my sister's grave an hour later. I talked to her tombstone as though she was there listening. I'd like to believe she was, and that she was pleased with my accomplishment. Afterwards, I returned home and slept through the day and all night. Once morning came, I heard some noise downstairs. I went down to see that my parents were home and sitting down to breakfast. They stopped and looked over at me, saying nothing. I walked over and pulled up a seat. I had no appetite at all. How was your trip? Where did you guys go? My parents exchanged looks before my father replied. We went out west to visit your aunt and uncle. Did you, you know, enjoy it? I had difficulty keeping my chin from quivering as I lowered my head again. Jeremy, sweetie, what's wrong? Both my mother and my father got up and came over to me. Why do you keep leaving me alone? God damn it. I'm the only kid you have left. Don't you give a fuck about me? They hugged me tightly, offering apologies. I could have sworn I felt another pair of hands on my shoulders. Their light touch was the most comforting of all. I really hope Janessa is proud of me. But a new task was ahead of me now. A harder task, perhaps. I was going to have to figure out how to reconcile with my parents. Our family had been broken long before her death. We'll never be whole again. But I know with some effort we can be better than this. I hope she can continue to give me the strength to put myself together as I progress into adulthood.